Good afternoon. My name is Wilmarie Newton, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We will be answering your questions as we go along, so please type them in the question box. If you have further questions after the webinar has ended, please feel free to email them to me, and I will forward them to the appropriate person that can answer them. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on CABE's website under professional development. And now I'd like to introduce Patrice McCarthy, Executive Director and General Counsel for CAPE. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Will Marie, our producer extraordinaire. <laughs> we are delighted to present this webinar in cooperation with the State Department of Education and members of the Educator Evaluation and Support Council. You're going to be hearing from several presenters today, including your representatives on the Council, Leonard Lockhart, CABE's current president, and Liz Brown, CABE's immediate past president. And they have been tireless in attending a multitude of meetings over the past year and a half to make sure that the voice of school boards was heard as these very important guidelines were being developed. We're going to give you an overview today and look at the role of boards of education in the implementation of these new guidelines, which will begin in the 2024-2025 school year. This has been a collaborative effort in developing the guidance and guidelines, and it will be a collaborative effort in the implementation. And I think you're going to hear today very strongly why that collaboration is critical to a robust educator evaluation and support program. I'm going to now turn it over to Carolyn Dugas. Good afternoon, Diane Dugas from ESCON. I had the distinct pleasure of um, assisting and facilitating the EES Council over the past um, several months and a couple of years. So I will uh, move us on. I'm not moving. Okay. Okay. That's it. Unless you can page up, um, page down. Okay. I'm not moving. Bear with us just one second. Oh, there, there we go. There we go. So, just wanted to share with you the evolution of educator evaluation. If you might recall, back in 2012, the Connecticut evaluation guidelines were created by what was at that time the Peak Council adopted by the Connecticut State Board of Education. The work that happened in 2012 proceeded into 2014, where all schools and districts implemented the new model. Um, there were pilot districts at that time. A revision actually happened in 2017, at which point um, we were really looking at a technical component of evaluation. Um, well, observation and feedback was an important part. As we move forward, we certainly aligned the importance of professional learning. In 2021, the EES Council, formerly the PEAK, convened to create the new guidelines of which we're presenting to you today. The guidelines that we'll be discussing today have a, a rich focus on the alignment of professional learning and the capacity of growth for both educators and leaders. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve the council and, and work in that facilitation and to share uh, the next components. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Liz Brown. I'm the former uh, president of uh, CAPE. Uh, it's been really an honor to serve on this committee and I think for boards of education, it's important to understand that we had a seat at the table and we're very, uh, it was a very inclusive process with all the leadership of the education leaders in Connecticut, you know, CAPS and CAVE and CAS and all the alphabet soup that we're familiar with. Uh, and we're very excited about the consensus that was developed. We didn't actually vote on, on the, uh, the proposal, the, the new guidelines, but certainly had robust conversations from all these perspectives. And I think for me, the most important thing was that as a Board of Education member, this is truly foundational to our education system, to have a sound professional development and evaluation system. 
So I, I'm taking this very serious. And I think I've been on the board in Waterbury for 12 years. And, you know, I, I'm really coming to truly understand the importance of all of us understanding our PDAC councils and understanding the role of uh, the board in making sure that we have a robust uh, PDAC council for professional development. So I think um, as we move forward, you can see that uh, after very a lot of months of discussions and disagreements, agreements uh, that uh, we're very uh, proud of the of the work that was accomplished. So this is kind of the you know the the steps you know started with disagreement, don't like but will support <laughs> more information needed, support with minor reservations to complete endorsement. So we spent a lot of time on three, four, and five. And then hopefully, then we kind of came in for a landing with two and one. So what we're presenting today is uh, after this, this total process uh, took place. Thank you very much. My name is Leonard Lockhart. I'm the current president of CADE and I also serve on the Windsor Board of Education. So as we went through this process, we came in with the lens of the Board of Ed members and with the understanding that we have several responsibilities, which is policy, curriculum, development appropriations, and to hire and supervise the superintendent. And one of the things that's under that piece is the superintendent is responsible for making sure that his or her staff are operating, functioning at a high level, and to execute the policy and the curriculum that has actually been developed by said board. With that being said, we took a look at the 2012 process and then came to the table with all the educational stakeholders and we discovered as Board of Ed members that there was a lot of uh, mistrust at the table in regards to the teacher evaluation process. As far as board members, we brought to the table the, the understanding that we need every educational stakeholder lockstep and in tune with each other so that we're educating every single child um, within the state of Connecticut. And what does that look like? And how is that robustful and fruitful for not only the staff, but the administrators as well as the superintendent, so that it's all focused on the child, while at the same time, the administrators as well as the teachers are fully, fully enthrust in their work, they're feeling fulfilled, they're feeling appreciated, and we're making sure that we provide them with the skills and tools they need to actually educate our children and to drive performance. So the one thing that we, we want to make sure is that we did not focus on a rating system. We want to focus on the actual performance of the child while tying some type of um, fruitful metrics to the teachers and administrators so that there's a collaboration where they're growing, they're able to teach to their strengths and their weaknesses, they're able to develop, and then there's a trust factor going back and forth, not only between the teachers and the administration, but also the administration and the Board of Education. We all know as Board of Education members, we are held accountable to our electorate to make sure that the school system is functioning at a high level and that we hold our superintendents um, to the same level of standard as we provide him or her their evaluation on an annual basis. So this process was rooted um, with that in mind for board members and I'm hoping at the end that we will all be in agreement. In that facilitation of the culture of trust, the EES committee began their process with a real deep dive into the research of best practices. Over the course of two years, the committee looked at discipline across, research across 20 years. Um, the perspectives of teacher evaluation and leader evaluation in that research was presented by Morgan Donaldson. Uh, out of Yukon, that research identifies that the technicality of ratings does not produce the growth and achievement, growth of educators and leaders or the achievement that we desire. In addition to that, mirroring that same research, the Wallace Foundation has a report, How Principles Affect Students in Schools. We know that leadership is second only to the educational practice of teachers and truly the work of leaders is about developing the capacity of human beings. It's about the organizational structures and systems that support that development. And it is also content knowledge. 
one of the highest leverage pieces of impact on growth is that from Hattie's work, that work from visible learning and a meta-analysis is that feedback has one of the greatest opportunities for growth. In addition to that, coupled with feedback is collaboration. So a synthesis of this research that was presented in addition to looking at the work of models around various states from Iowa, Massachusetts, Ohio, and then looking internally across our state, Farmington, Mansfield, the work that some of our RESCs do at Advance and EastCon, identified best practices that aligned with research, that ratings are not the way to go, that having collaborative work, adults learn best when they work together, and um, taking a look at the impact of professional learning. Those best practices came together in the council identifying the guiding principles that really frame the work of the guidelines. There are seven principles. These principles from best practice as well as a series of listening events that happened across the state captured the voice from the field. So these seven principles about allowing for differentiated roles, it's not a one size fits all, that within the teaching profession and the leadership roles, there are various, various people who, principals, assistant principals, central office, teachers, counselors, social workers, that while they have commonalities of supporting the professional growth of each other, as well as the learning and achievement of students, they do have different roles. Simplifying and reducing the burden, really eliminating the technicality, which the past model was really focused on, and focusing on being able to go deep with things that matter, which is the third principle. And then connecting to best practices. We know that a positive outcome from COVID is the ability to look at the whole child, not just academics, but social, emotional, and physical development. And then really looking, we know that through the growth of leadership and educators, that growth on then their change in practice ultimately has an impact on the change in student outcomes. So meaningful professional learning needs to be coupled with goal setting. It can't just be goal setting, but then what is it that I need to learn and grow? And then aligning with research, that specific, timely, and accurate, actionable, and reciprocal feedback really makes a difference. So how do we think about these principles and how they inform what the guidelines are? The guidelines were written with these six elements standards and criteria, the very first being that a set of professional standards is still needed for us. That's what gives us our vision, vision of effective leadership, effective teaching and learning, and effective professional learning. We are going to continue to goal set. The difference in the goal setting process is that it's about really focusing on what matters and high leverage practice. Professional practice and educator leader growth I think what we've learned through time is that we have to couple professional learning with the practice and have reflection and feedback on that. And it's through that process that we ultimately have the outcomes that we expect for both adults as well as children. The process elements are very similar in to what you may currently have in the evaluation process, but it is that more technical side of the work. It's how many observations, when they're done, um, by whom, and that element. And then, as we know, um, as board members, there's a dispute resolution that is typically guided by um, the process. The guidelines are coordinated by educator and leader. While there's commonality, there are differences. For example, we don't do a classroom observation with a leader, but we do a site visit, and the standards are different. While the educator focuses on heavily on instruction, curriculum instruction and assessment, the leader is focused on the development and capacity of people and the organizational systems that support educators. So there's commonality but differences and they're highlighted. They're also written, the guidelines are written with non-negotiables and best practices. 
while the non-negotiables are best practices and a shift in the in the um, from the 2012 model. Um, we know that this is a could be a lift for some, and it's a continual process. So those best practices are to be strived for. Mm -hmm. As we talk about the the importance of professional learning. In, back in 2012, the State Department of Education did adopt the Learning Forward Standards. In 2022, they were revised. As we look at how these work with professional practice standards, they really help us as educators see how we do the work. They are interactive. It's about taking a look at transformational processes, the design in which we learn, how we design our professional learning and the rigor and inclusivity of the content for all professionals. So you can begin to see how these relate to the guidelines by thinking about differentiated roles and thinking about adult learning and how we need to think of changing our practice. In addition, equity threads through all of these components in the professional learning and that's certainly a, a strong focus for us in Connecticut. The way the standards meet repre represents a convergence and a connection and an alignment. It is a cycle of continuous improvement, and that is the ultimate concept and goal of the new guidelines, that it is a continuous learning process. It doesn't end. Similar, it's an infinity process. This is a busy slide. Um, <laughs> know that in the model, when it, it comes out, when the guidelines come out with a, a sample model, that the guidelines were really represented through this process. It is continuous. Um, some of the elements, the process elements that were identified, that there have to be at least three check-ins between an evaluator and an evaluatee, whether that's a principal and an educator or a central office person with their, with their leaders. It really is at the beginning of the year, the opportunity to have conversations around self-reflection. What am I doing well? Where do I need to grow? What's the evidence of that? We take a look at that from using the standards that were identified. Those standards are now the choice of PDEX to make the decision on what standards they would like to use. There's heavy responsibility of the PDEX to make that consensus decision making so that it does allow for agreement, shared voice, and to Leonard's point, a, a trust, a foundation of trust in the process. So through that self-reflection and evidence, identification of goals, the big difference in the guidelines here are about high leverage goals. It's not just about an achievement, it is about the whole child, it's about the alignment of professional learning and impact on practice to the ultimate learning growth and achievement of students. Having that conference with between evaluator and evaluatee, a difference in these guidelines that you evaluatees have the opportunity to think about one, two, or three-year goals, determine if they're doing those individually or collectively in teams. That allows the opportunity to lessen the burden and to allow for deeper, richer conversations. Once the goals have been set and a learning plan has been put into place, that work continues. Observations sure, happen in between those check-in times where conver reciprocal conversations between the leader and the educator or leader to leader happen, and at least one other time, a mid-year check-in. In that mid-year check-in, it's being provided with evidence for discussion, adjustments are being made, perhaps new or different professional learning, and always showing the impact of practice on out student outcomes. And then again, at the end of the year, that end of the year reflection and feedback, that evidence of impact of practice on student growth and achievement, and thinking forward to what's to come in the following year. So you can see it's an ongoing cycle. Observations and reviews of practice happen in between. I think the real difference, you may look at this and say, how is this different? Some of the decisions are different. The opportunities to work collaboratively, more learning partnerships over time, 
and really striving for that coherence. But in addition to that, it is about the implementation. It's about the conversations that are happening and being able to really discuss more frequently feedback and reflection. We know that we have a, a shortage of educators and the impact of, of COVID and various factors on our profession. Learning Forward did a study in March of 2023, almost a year ago. I think one of the important things to see as a board here and at the council um, has identified with the focus in the guidelines is that professional learning matters and it matters based on retention. As you can see from the study from Learning Forward, it's not salary that makes the biggest difference. It's the ability to have the opportunity to have development and support and to have leadership. Leadership not in the sense of a role, but leadership in the terms of influence. Voice matters. Having a self-voice around my learning, having a self-voice, um, being able to identify a direction that has an impact that grows self-efficacy and certainly retention in our field. Okay, Sharon. <clears throat> Hi hey all, I'm Sharon Fuller from the Talent Office at the State Department of Education. Um, and I just want to take a check to see if Kathy is is with us. She has not she been able not. to join okay. us yet. Okay. okay, so this slide was going to be presented by Kathy Greeter, who is superintendent of Farmington Public Schools. Um, this is a slide that she used with her Board of Education to help explain the shifts in what we're well, our new guidelines are promoting versus what's currently in place. So you can see up on the, on the slides, there has been a shift from individual compliance to more of co collaboration, trust, and commitment. And we're hoping that there are opportunities for educators to work with other educators, for leaders to work with other leaders, and build that collaboratives to have a, a culture of continuous um, learning in, in the school and the district. There's a shift from a single score, and that, that has been mentioned uh, this ratings, afternoon, yeah. the ratings, to focusing on high quality feedback, support, growth, and continuous learning. So it's not just about the score, although the achievement is important, it's more about uh, supporting the educators and the leaders so that they can do what they need to do, as Leonard said, to support all of our students here in, in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. High expectations for all. So really the shift is focusing on whole child goals aligned to standards and the vision or portrait of a graduate. Um, I, I know that through various trainings, um, participants have asked about uh, the alignment of goals. And when we break it down and, and share some of the components that do exist in districts for vision of the graduate, um, participants are able to see that there's more opportunities to align with what the district has as goals. And innovation, this is really um, our, our, I think I speak for all members of our council that this is an opportunity for true transformational improvement in our schools, in our districts. Um, we encourage districts to be innovative as you are developing your district plan. Um, they do need to align to the guidelines but there's an opportunity to really be visionary in what you want to accomplish in terms of professional learning and continuous growth with your, your districts. So, um, Kathy, I, I wish you um, <laughs> were here with us and were able to join, but I do want to give credit to Kathy Greeter for uh, sharing this with us and for all of the information that she's shared from a superintendent's per perspective through this process. So professional development and evaluation committees have much more um, opportunity for decision making in regards to the development um, collectively of their plan. They are responsible not just for the evaluation and support development, but also for a professional learning plan and really marrying the two and seeing it as a process that is ongoing and interactive. And you can see by this um, quote, certainly from Learning Forward, that when paired with timely and accurate and meaningful feedback, reflective dialogue, that the evaluation process has potential to move practice and certainly impact 
um, the transformation that we're seeking. So it's an exciting time. Yes. It's, um, I think what we've seen also from trainings that have happened is that um, the work of the council and bringing that to life through the trainings is that it's providing inspiration across the state. Well, thank you very much. Before I proceed, um, I want to make sure that um, we're all value partners at the table here. And Kate Phil was not able to be here once we started the meeting. <laughs> but so I she's want to, now. she's here now and we value everybody. We want to afford for the opportunity to be able to address the boards of education at this time. Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> My name is Kate Field and I'm with the Connecticut Education Association. I so appreciate the opportunity to sit here with everyone. Uh, it's been quite a process to create these new guidelines and all of the information that has been shared by these uh, stakeholders has been incredibly valuable. Uh, from the teachers unions, unions perspective, these new guidelines create a wonderful opportunity both to meet the needs of the whole child in this dire mental health crisis that they are experiencing, but also to elevate the importance of professional learning and to set goals that are innovative, but also meet the learning needs of students, but also provide opportunities for us to support the kids that we love. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here. My pleasure. So um, as, as Cade, it, we, we would be remiss not to share what is the role of the Board of Education member. And one of the things that we are responsible for is to uh, provide guidance and to evaluate the superintendent. Um, we recognize that we are macro managers, the superintendent is the micro manager, and the chief executive of the district. And we are responsible for reviewing the, his or her report on an annual basis on the overall um, health of the organization. And this is one of the things that we should be focused on is the actual evaluation process um, to see what that looks like, um, if there's any issues with the collective bargaining unit, and just to make sure everyone is being fulfilled um, within this. Um, as Board of Ed members, we should make sure that we invest in professional development of all of our staff and to make sure that we invest in professional development of us as board members to make sure that we're in alignment and understanding truly what the educational environment is um, so that we can make wise and educated decisions as board members um, as we vote to support our superintendent. We have to make sure that the superintendent is invested in professional development, not only of themselves, but every single individual up underneath his or her leadership so that it is gonna be a true return on investment for the children that we are there to educate. We are here to educate every single child in the state of Connecticut with a high quality public education and with the understanding that no matter what district you are in, the decisions you make in your district can impact other districts. And we need to be mindful of that. We're not in our own silos. We're in this work together and we're in this work together to support and work with our um, stakeholders and to make sure that we hold each other accountable. Um, accountability is something that's not escaping this process and it starts with us as board members and we need to exude that confidence and that stern vision um, down the pipeline through our superintendent. I'd like to also mention that according to the, the state law, one of our roles is to mutually agree on the plan that the PDAC council in our districts comes up with. So there's an opportunity for us to, you know, do a deeper dive into the PDEC Council, its work, and, you know, as Leonard said, make sure that it's budget time, make sure that the resources to implement the plan mm -hmm. are there, and the time. That came up a lot, huh, mm -hmm. Kim? It, the time that, you know, scheduling is always very difficult. There's never enough time in the day, and I think we have to really look at that and say, are are we setting up our calendar year so that we really have pr true professional development going on? It's not just 10 minutes here and 15 minutes here and everybody's crazy. Mm -hmm. I think we really, that's an important component of, of making sure, you know, professional development, uh, you know, is going to really happen on a deeper level. So the time and scheduling really came up a lot during our conversations, the lack of, exactly. <laughs> the lack of. So I think anything we can do to make sure that there's a block of time for professional development. So uh, when the plan is developed by the PDAC Council, it will come before you 
uh, for approval and for mutual approval. So I think that's an opportunity to really look at, at the district's uh, plan and uh, really become a lot more knowledgeable about it. So with that, we want to see what questions you may have for us. Will Marie, can you see if there are any questions in the chat? We don't have any questions at the moment, but we will open the floor up. Very good. And we will practice good <laughs> educator wake time. <laughs> okay, next slide. You see here on the final slide the uh, names of all the individuals that contributed to the development of this webinar, and we we thank all of them, those that are here today and those that uh, contributed in, in several meetings that we had to bring this together. It's quite possible that everybody did such a thorough job. <laughs> there, are no there, are no there are no questions. Well, we'll have to have a, a follow-up webinar when you find out more about the PDAC Council in your district, and then you could tell us about it. <laughs> Jason, yes. I, just, I just also wanted to let you know that um, it was referenced a state model plan. We are planning to recommend on behalf of the Educator Evaluation and Support Council to the state board at its February 14th meeting oh, okay. that they adopt the state model, and hopefully that will, will go through, and if so, then the State Department of Education will have a communication ready to send out to superintendents within the, the day or two following the state board meeting. Sharon, I wonder just in terms of the purpose of a state model and the board's role in that, if we well, share that. Thank you. <laughs> to make sure the microphone can be on. Thank you. So, thank you, Diane. So, we, we do need to have a state model for a couple of reasons. One is that many of our smaller districts who don't have the capacity to do multiple projects as some of our larger districts do, they very often adopt the state model plan because it's something that aligns to the guidelines and mm -hmm. they can they can mm -hmm. implement it for, from there. But as uh, Liz mentioned, the state, your board of education and your PDEC need to mutually agree on the plan that's eventually sent to the State Department of Education for approval and that means is it aligned to the guidelines if the local board and the PDEC cannot mutually agree on that the state model plan is one to be considered to be implemented in the district if there happens to be a situation where the board or the PDEC don't mutually agree on that state model plan then it's the responsibility of the local board to develop a plan um, I, I've been in this role for a long time even prior to 2012, and I can honestly say that we haven't had to use that, that as well, but that many districts do find the state model plan to help inform their own plan moving along. So that's good to know, yep. Will Marie, is there any questions in the queue? Any hands raised? Yes. So we have a question here. Um, they said um, they might have missed this, but when is the district plan model due by for approval? So the, the draft model plan will be recommended to the State Board of Education on February 14th. Um, districts will need to submit a plan to the State Department of Ed prior to the start of the 24-25 school year. So having said that, please know that um, your initial plan um, needs to align to the guidelines, but over time it can evolve into that visionary practice that you may be thinking of in your PDEC. And I know in Waterbury, the PDEC Council has been working for the past year already, mm -hmm. and I'm sure many districts are already in the thick of it, uh, preparing for this. So I think uh, that's that's a good thing, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions or comments, Will Marie? So follow up to that, um, they said, so there's no actual hard date. 
um, like I said, we're working on a communication to send to districts following um, what we hope the state board will adopt the model plan, and we will have more information in that. Um, typically, we have um, what's called the EES check, EESP checklist, Educator Evaluation and Support Plan checklist. Um, so we will use a process similar to that, but obviously it would need to be adapted to the, the new requirements. So we will keep districts informed as, as soon as possible. You know, as a as a board member, I would assume that we should have have at least an idea of the plan by April or May, so that they could prepare. I mean, the school year starts in September, so you don't you don't want to wait till August to do this. I I'm pretty sure most districts are are developing the plan, and you'll see it March or April. I, I might. Just say we're working with districts across the state, okay. and I know that we have a wide variance of the amount of time in which PDEX have had to work on it. Okay. And so we have everything from an hour a month to full days a month. And so I know that there are many districts that are looking to have as much time as possible. As we've shared here today, it's there's the technicality of creating the document the mm -hmm. evaluation but it's really the transformational mind right. shift in the practices so in the trainings we're really talking with districts about starting with understanding things like rubrics and understanding and the choices that have to be made mm -hmm. so that may take a little bit more time so if a board has to uh, approve the plan thinking that the last meeting of a board may be in June until September. Might there need to be an additional meeting in August once a plan is really fully developed to give that time. Okay. Um, so I'm just putting that out there from some of the things we're hearing from districts to really allow and not feel that it's a check the box to get it done, but really right. carefully and thoughtfully um, doing that. So it's a good it's point. Yeah. Not needed to be um, until the prior of the start of the school year, and that is usually late August, then the opportunity to also, some districts may want that time over the summer, and then what does that mean for a board to either add a meeting or a special meeting to review that? So just putting that out there from what we've heard from the field. Okay. And also, if there are additional questions, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, um, I will work with districts in the CES at Advance and Learn regions, and my colleague Jessica Ocasio will work with districts in the ACES, CREC, and ESCON regions. So um, you can reach out to either one of us, any of you can, but those are the, the districts that we typically work with to, to answer questions. Great. So I do... I do have another question here, um, and I'm sorry if <laughs> if it was covered, um, but um, the question says, um, basically boards only have a couple of months to adopt this. Um, is there a thought to extend the, date, the deadline because we don't have a lot of time after the model guidelines come out? Uh, the legislation is, is pretty clear that the new guidelines need to be um, in place July 1st, 2024. So that's where the 24-25 school year mm -hmm. comes in. Um, but your your district PDEC and board could mutually agree to adopt the state model plan initially and then evolve over the course of next year mm -hmm. and make changes along the way to have something that's, that's um, more of what your PDEC and board would like to have. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the questions box right now. Okay. Thank you. With that, thank, thank you for participating. If you have colleagues that were not able to participate today, this webinar will be archived on the CAVE website so that you'll have access to it in the future. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everyone.